this is Chris the Dive Zone Scuba for another technical diving tips, techniques, and trips video. One of the big discussions in the dive sector is the issue of whether or not you can or can't uh, improve your gas consumption. So there are people who say uh, that no, you can't. And if you try to do something like skip, breathe, uh, that you're going to build up carbon dioxide and uh, that is not going to help you any. This group of people suggests that if you do have high gas consumption, that what you need to do is you just need to die with a larger tank. On the other hand, there is a group of people that say, yes, you can improve your gas consumption. And these people will suggest different breathing type techniques using your diaphragm or skip breathing or using some particular breathing pattern or even using some yoga breathing techniques. So on this particular subject in the dive community, uh, there still is uh, a bit of controversy as to whether or not you can actually improve your gas consumption or not. Before we begin to discuss this issue, let's take a look at how gas consumption is actually measured. For the purposes of this video, we're going to measure gas consumption in uh, SAC, and SAC stands for surface air consumption. So this is actually the cubic feet of gas per minute uh, that you breathe corrected to the surface. We are correcting this to the surface because down at depth, uh, as you may recall from some of your earlier scuba classes, you breathe more gas uh, the deeper you are. There is another term you might come across called RMV, which stands for respiratory minute volume. And that is different than SAC because RMV is not corrected for the surface, whereas SAC is. So what that makes uh, us do is have uh, apples to apples um, comparison uh, when we see uh, what kind of gas consumption that we have. If you're interested in learning how to calculate your SAC rate, there's another video on the channel. Uh, we're not going to get into that um, aspect of the uh, SAC rate calculation today. So uh, please look at that video. Here's a graphic that illustrates the uh, concept of gas consumption rates. I have the gas consumption rates of five people on this chart, person A, B, C, D, and E. And we're gonna take a look at um, how this works for each of these individuals. So person A is probably the type of person who's um, watching this video. And uh, person A, like person B, both have a range of gas consumption rates. And person A has a SAC rate uh, at the lowest uh, value of about 0.5. And uh, in the worst case, person A will have a SAC rate of um, uh, 0.9 uh, cubic feet per minute. Another person, uh, person B on this chart, has a lower SAC rate of about 0.3 and a worst case situation SAC rate of about 0.5. So you'll notice that um, person B's uh, absolute worst sack rate uh, is actually as good as person A's best sack rate. So this illustrates the fact that most people's sack rate uh, varies or can vary quite a bit. And uh, there's a great difference between people in terms of their sack rates. Now let's take a look at person C uh, who has a sack rate of 0.5. Uh, person D who has a sac rate of about uh, 0.3 uh, and um, then lastly person E that has a sac rate of about 0.2. Okay so these three people are actually not divers. Uh, what they are is they are people who are on a ventilator and so people who are on ventilators are only the people who do not have a variance in their sac rate. So the calculation for these three people is based on what is known as the 12-12 rule. And so the sac rate in cubic feet per minute is based upon how long or how large the person's uh, lung volume, uh, usable lung volume is expected to be um, uh, per kilogram of body weight. And that happens to be 12 milliliters. And then so what you do to determine what their usable lung volume is, uh, you multiply that times their body weight, in this case, 40 to 100 kilograms of body weight and then you 
according to the 12-12 rule, um, assume that the person breathes uh, 12 breaths per minute. And then we have 28.32 liters uh, per cubic foot because we're switching back and forth between metric and, um, and uh, the imperial. So what this illustrates is that the only people who have a consistent sac rate are people on ventilators. And even then, people who are on ventilators, the sac rate could differ significantly based upon uh, their size. Now that we know that SAC rates can differ both within and between individual divers, let's talk about some possible factors that can affect gas consumption rates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to categorize these uh, as less controllable and more controllable factors. Less controllable factors uh, seem to evolve around an individual's physiology. And uh, as we all know, everyone is different. Larger people in general, seem to consume more gas than smaller people, and people with higher metabolisms seem to uh, breathe more gas than people with slower metabolisms. So with these types of factors, uh, the less controllable factors, there's only so much that an individual diver can do uh, to assist them with their gas consumption rate uh, in a reasonable amount of time. On the other hand, we have more controllable factors, and uh, I'm going to categorize these into experience, environment, and equilibrium, and uh, that's what we're going to discuss. Um, these are not all inclusive. I'm sure there are many other uh, possible factors that do affect gas consumption rates that divers do have some control over, uh, but that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you think there are more uh, factors, I encourage you to make uh, your own video. So here's a pretty busy chart uh, discussing this whole issue about uh, more controllable factors. And um, uh, I will say that uh, this chart and these factors uh, are for me, at least in my experience. Your mileage, of course, uh, may vary. So again, uh, we have person A, uh, who was actually me, and uh, I... Uh, have a situation where it's quite possible to have higher gas consumption uh, with respect to experience. Uh, I know that when I had a lower level of training, I consumed more gas. Uh, when I was less skilled, I consumed more gas. And uh, these uh, two things uh, result in less experience, uh, which results in more gas. So then there's also the environment, and uh, in a technical dive, uh, when I'm dragging four or five tanks all together, I find that I used uh, a higher amount of gas. Uh, if I have a high level of activity, like I'm videographing uh, something, uh, I have a high uh, level of consumption. If I'm using a lower O2, I seem to have a higher gas consumption. Also, poor visibility, cold water, and high current. Kicking against high current is guaranteed to increase your gas consumption. So the experience and the environmental factors uh, combine, uh, have an interaction, uh, and create what I call equilibrium. So uh, if you're struggling, uh, you have anxiety about something going on, uh, you're in a panic situation, you're in an emergency situation, you are going to have a tendency uh, to have uh, poor equilibrium, what I'll call poor equilibrium, and that is going to result in higher gas consumption. On the other hand, where lower gas consumption is possible with experience, uh, the opposite, higher level of training, more skilled, uh, you're more experienced, uh, you're more comfortable uh, in a particular situation, that's going to possibly result in lower gas consumption. Environment, uh, with recreational diving, I use less gas. Uh, if I have lower activity, I don't uh, uh, video anything or take any photographs, uh, do smaller things like that. Uh, I'll have lower gas consumption. High gas consumption, uh, my records indicate that uh, if I have uh, Nitrox 32, for example, I have um, uh, less gas consumption on, on the same type of dive versus air. Good visibility, warm water, low current, all those uh, help reduce my uh, gas consumption. Uh, so these things, uh, equilibrium-wise, um, are situations where the diver has uh, fluid movement, uh, they're relaxed, uh, and uh, they're in control, uh, more control uh, of the dive. So what we want to do is we want to get to the point where we have good equilibrium and uh, all other things being equal. 
that should help us uh, improve our gas consumption. So let's talk about uh, actually how do you go about uh, improving your gas consumption. Well, the first thing is, uh, and this is something from um, the engineering world, the total quality management world, uh, in order to improve a process, you must first be able to measure it. And in this case, not only do you need to be able to measure it, but you need to measure it in real time. In the old days, when you didn't have the technology necessarily to uh, measure your sack rate uh, in real time, uh, a lot of the things that you could possibly do to help improve your sack rate were just not uh, feasible because of the lack of technology. Because we can now measure our sack rate um, uh, instantaneously in real time, uh, what that enables us to do is to get feedback. So we now have the ability to develop a feedback loop, uh, and this is commonly called a control cycle. And so what it begins with is at the top where you set some standard, uh, then uh, you go to the right where you observe performance, and then you go to the bottom where you're going to compare the standard and performance, and then it goes to the um, uh, position on the left uh, where you take corrective action and then you go back to set the standard. So uh, this is a four-step process and it is a continuous process. Uh, it does not stop. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply the control cycle feedback loop to our particular situation. So uh, we start with um, uh, our desire to improve our sack rate. And then we observe our current uh, real-time instantaneous sack rate and what we're doing uh, at the time and how we're doing what we're doing. So then we compare our current sack rate to our previous sack rate and we try to do whatever's possible uh, that results in the lower sack rate and then we're back to the beginning where uh, we start the loop over again. So this is the concept that we're going to be using to attempt to improve our sack rate. So an easy way to do this, uh, perhaps the easiest way to do this, uh, is to uh, acquire a wrist-mounted um, air-integrated computer. On the other hand, if you're really good with numbers, you could probably try this with just a submersible pressure gauge. You will also need an underwater wet notes notebook. So what you're going to do is you're going to frequently observe uh, your real-time sack rate and uh, you're also going to uh, try different things uh, and then you're going to uh, record the pertinent information uh, into the wet notes in real time. So if you think that something like uh, different breathing patterns uh, would help you or you want to know if it doesn't help you, uh, you would uh, practice uh, that particular technique uh, while observing your sac rate and recording the fact that you were doing that. What I sometimes do is intentionally try to be as relaxed as possible while I'm on a particular dive, and I will start recording the data associated with uh, that particular technique. So you're going to frequently monitor uh, your real-time sack rate, and this is why it's easier to use a wrist-mounted computer and not having to reach for a console. Uh, so uh, we have two different types of computers here. On the left is a Mare's Genius, and on the right is a Shearwater Perdix AI. And um, one thing that you need to realize is that uh, wrist-mounted computers could display uh, your sack rate, or what they call your sack rate, in PSI bar, cubic feet, or liters per minute. If it's displayed in something like PSI or bar, you're going to have to go through the conversion process based upon the size of the uh, tank that you're using in order to get the actual sack rate in cubic feet per minute, for example. As far as the wet notes are concerned, uh, what you want to do is you want to monitor uh, your uh, computer, and then when your rate goes down, uh, you want to record uh, what you were doing uh, that may have resulted in uh, the improvement. Conversely, you could also record um, what you were doing when your rate went up uh, to avoid having to uh, try to not do that anymore. Because you're using wet notes uh, and you do not have to uh, destroy your data, uh, you're going to have the opportunity to analyze a lot of data. So what you're looking for is what techniques uh, are there uh, that appear to consistently work for you. If it works once and not the next time, 
then maybe it's not really a good technique. Uh, it's not consistent enough. So once you find out what appears to consistently work for you, then go ahead and deliberately practice it a few times uh, to verify that it actually does work. So using these techniques, uh, I have discovered uh, to an extent uh, what works particularly for me and uh, may not, uh, of course, work for you, uh, but I need to go and deliberately say that. Uh, and so one is, um, if I want to improve my sack rate, uh, I will not engage in photography or videography. That's a high level activity uh, type situation. And uh, for me, that will always burn up a lot of, um, a lot of breathing gas. Uh, for most people, uh, maintaining proper weighting and trim uh, will uh, help uh, improve sack, uh, your sack rate. And um, uh, one of the things about that is, is if you have a good horizontal trim position, uh, you're going to be more relaxed. And anything that relaxes you, uh, that increases your um, equilibrium, uh, is going to uh, probably help you with your gas consumption. Another one, very specific one, and uh, I catch myself doing this all the time, or rather not doing it, uh, is to minimize uh, unnecessary movements. Uh, so, so if you can get away with moving your eyes instead of your entire head or even your entire body, uh, then minimizing these unnecessary movements will generally help you uh, improve your gas consumption. A really big one for me is that um, I have discovered that forced breathing patterns do not help me at all. Uh, so um, not having any kind of forced breathing pattern where I may inhale for five seconds and then exhale for five seconds or whatever it may be, uh, I have not discovered a forced breathing pattern that will actually um, that will actually help me. And again, uh, these are things that I have discovered uh, using an air integrated um, risk computer. Uh, and also uh, a set of wet notes uh, that helped me in particular. So uh, you are probably completely different than me. So what works for me is not necessarily going to work for you. And the only way that you're going to be able to find out what works for you is if you go and record your instantaneous sack rate while trying different techniques and recording them on a set of wet notes for further analysis at a later time. This is Chris with Dive Zone Scuba. I hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching and please subscribe.